Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's TMS. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you Ms. Professor Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester, which is my home institution. Um, Professor Cobb did his bachelor's in psychology at Sheffield, followed by a PhD in psychology and genetics also at the University of Sheffield. Um, he spent many years researching in France, first on an exchange program from the Royal Society, then as a lectureship at Sorbonne Paris Nord University, previously Paris 13 University, um, and then with the CR, CNRS, um, working primarily in um, chemical communications, the sense of smell in Drosophila and chemical communication in ants. In 2002, the professor returned to the UK to take up a lectureship at the University of Manchester. He's now professor of zoology at Manchester. Um, and uh, central to this talk, uh, Professor Cobb is a uh, history of science and the science communicator, um, uh, writer and author. He also lectures at Manchester in history of science and uh, published several books and also translated several books. And for this talk today, um, he's going to present to you the idea of the brain on which he published the book of the same title in 2020, The Idea of the Brain, which is also translated into Italian. Uh, and I will put that in the title of the book into the chat during the talk. Okay. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank okay. You, thank, you very, thank you very much, Ariana. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And my apologies uh, for not speaking Italian, which is uh, my fault. But never mind. I will try and speak as clearly as possible. And uh, I hope you'll find this interesting. So the, to start with, I'm going to talk about the brain. But you need to realize that for most of human history, most people around the planet have believed that thinking is done with the heart. And we can see this in our everyday language. And I should have got the equivalent phrases in Italian. I'm sorry, because you have these words, phrases in Italian. These are all English phrases which we use every day in which the heart plays a fundamental role. And if we replaced any of those phrases by brain, it would be very, very strange. You, you know, you have, these, you have these phrases in Italian. Every language has words like this, phrases like this, in which the heart plays a fundamental role. And that's telling us something. It's, a, it's kind of a linguistic fossil. It's a remnant of the old way of thinking about the world. And that's telling us something as well, is that not only is this very widespread and common, but also the reason why those words are there. They're there because they make sense. If you think about it, when you're excited, your heart starts to pound. If you're frightened, it's your guts that start to, your stomach that starts to squirrel around. Nobody feels anything in their head. We use those, those old words exist. These, this idea of thought and emotion being located somewhere else in the body, and every culture has that. Those, that feeling is there because that's what it feels like. Okay, so one of the things that, uh, about studying the, the history of science, or the history of ideas in any way, is you're not allowed to say that people in the past believed something because they were stupid because people in the past were just as clever as us, and some of them were incredibly clever, and yet they believed things that we now consider to be outlandish or funny or strange. So the, the task is to try and understand why did they think that? What was it that they couldn't see that we can do? And to understand how we got to realizing that the brain is significant, as in most things, we need to go back to the ancient Greeks because they are the source of so many thoughts, uh, ideas about this in the West at least. And Aristotle 
uh, the Greek uh, thinker, he argued that the heart was the center of thought because it moved and motion was being seen as being absolutely fundamental. Around about the fifth century uh, before uh, the common era, Herophilus, Rasistratus and Hippocrates all argued that it wasn't the heart at all, that it was the brain that was fundamental. But they had no evidence for this. It was based partly on looking comparative anatomy. You would look at an animal and you could see that all the sense organs would go into uh, the brain and they wouldn't, weren't connected to the heart. So they were starting to think, well, maybe all those sense organs going up here, that suggests that it's the brain that's fundamental. The key experimental evidence came with Galen, who as well as uh, developing, you may have heard of Galen's idea of the, the humours, which passed for medicine for over nearly 2000 years, uh, as well as being writing about medicine, he was also a philosopher, a poet, an anatomist, and he carried out experiments. And he did a rather in, unpleasant experiment, which I'm not going to describe in any detail, but basically with a pig, he showed that if you stopped its heart from beating, it remained conscious, it carried on making noises, whereas if you pressed on its brain, it immediately went unconscious and it stopped making a noise. And this experiment was well known, but people didn't think, well, okay, that proves that it must be the brain that's uh, the key part because of the weight of Aristotle's ideas. And, you know, that was really fundamental. One of the key things about the ancient world and the medieval world was that ancient authority really carried a lot of weight, more weight than doing an experiment. And we can see that by the 17th century, there was some uncertainty about this. More anatomical studies had shown that the brain was really, really complicated, whereas the heart was, well, just a pump, really. And this, uh, what we have here is uh, one of the songs from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. And during one of the songs, which is sung by uh, one of the characters, we have this little phrase at the beginning. Tell me where is fancy, fancy being imagination or ideas. Tell me where is fancy bread? Where does it come from? Or in the heart or in the head? So Shakespeare here was saying that he knew that all those clever anatomists and philosophers, that they weren't sure. They didn't know whether ideas were based in the heart or in the brain. And furthermore, he knew that the audience who weren't, you know, all intellectuals. There were a lot of ordinary people went to Shakespeare's plays. He knew that they would get this as well. So this is something that was widely known, not just amongst intellectual circles, in the West in the 17th century, was that we weren't really sure where thought was based, but it was unclear whether it was in the, in the heart, the old idea, or in the head. And, What's fundamental is that despite Galen's experiment, there was no brain centric moment. There wasn't a, a single decisive experiment that made everybody go, oh, well, it's obviously in the brain. Instead, you get a slow accumulation of certainty from anatomical data that shows that the brain is amazingly complicated and is connected to all the sense organs and the heart just has this kind of pumping function. And as that happened, people started to think about, well, well, how does it actually work? And the first person to really come up with an idea for how the brain might function was Descartes. And Descartes was struck by these statues, these kind of animatronic statues that he saw in public gardens in Paris in the 1630s. And here we can see a, a kind of, uh, I think it's Hercules or somebody, is it going to, hit the dragon on the head with his club. And this all works by weights. It all works by weights and uh, hydraulics in particular. So there's water being pumped up and down. And what Descartes thought was, well, this looks like movement. And these things were pretty kind of creepy at the time. They looked really quite real. So he thought, well, maybe that's how we work. Maybe you've got kind of pressurized fluids in our nerves, and here we've got a, a big baby um, who's about to burn his, his, thing, his foot, marked B, on the fire, marked A, and what Descartes argued is that 
something would then move up into the brain, marked F, where it would reflect back. And this idea of reflection is where eventually the idea of a reflex came from. So that was Descartes' idea, and it was pretty soon, almost as certain soon as it was published, demonstrated to be wrong, because it, what people did was to get animals like frogs, and you would dissect out a nerve, and you would cut it, and there was no kind of hydraulic power in there, no, no spurt, nothing came powering out of the nerve. So the nerves clearly didn't have anything like the hydraulic power that Descartes had suggested. But nonetheless, what's so important here is that he's taking the most advanced technology he can and thinking, well, maybe that's how, maybe that's how brains work. You can see this again in uh, the development of quite extraordinary automata. I'm going to show you this little robot. It's a clockwork toy, but it's not really a toy, um, which was made by the Swiss watchmaker Pierre Jacques Edros. And you can still see this on display in Neuchâtel in Switzerland. And uh, what he does was to write. I think you should be able to see this. Look, you can program him to write letters, both li single letters, but also whole letters, correspondence. He's all doing this by clockwork. Look at the eyes, creepy. I think they probably should have had his tongue stick out as he's, uh, he was doing it. So this is quite extraordinary uh, robot. And, and, and although nobody thought that we had cogs in our heads, because when you open up a brain, there are no cog wheels in it. Um, nonetheless, this was seen to be, so, you know, we could get to create some kind of, something that looked remarkably uh, human by a machine. And the big breakthrough in understanding how all this might work, not by clockwork, not by uh, uh, hydraulics, came with the mastery of electricity. First in the 18th century, people were able to uh, show that electricity would enable muscles to twitch uh, in frogs. And then finally, with the development of new batteries, uh, then Aldini uh, carried out these really quite grotesque demonstrations. This was done in private. This particular one here was done in 1804. This man here was a, an Englishman who had killed his wife and child. He was hanged and then his body was immediately taken off the scaffold and placed on a table. And then they got these batteries here. They connected either side of his uh, head with electrodes and then a continuous pulse of electricity led to his eyes opening, his arms moving. You can imagine the kind of terrifying uh, imagery you would see from uh, this kind of display. And although thankfully uh, this kind of work on human bodies was only done a few times and in private, it became quite normal to go and watch a demonstration in which, say, you do the same thing, say, with a cow's head. You would have a cow killed backstage and then you would bring the body onto uh, the stage and you would connect it to the electrodes and you could see movement being created. And this was done in theatres. And in particular, uh, an English scientist called Humphrey Davy carried out uh, displays like this in London at the Royal Institution. And a young girl um, called Mary Godwin apparently went along and was very, very impressed, struck by these use of electricity to apparently recreate life. Uh, and a few years after that, uh, she married uh, a very famous English poet called um, Shelley, and she became Mary Shelley, and she wrote a book called Frankenstein. So uh, the, these ideas, the power of electricity was not only about the brain, but it was also about life itself. And with the mastery of electricity in the telegraph system, which happened in the 1830s, the country, whole continents got covered with the telegraph system. Here we've got a map of the UK, and these are the telegraph wires, which are basically following the, the uh, railway lines that were also being built at the time. And people drew a parallel between the organization of the telegraph system and of the nervous system of the human body. And they argued it went both ways, that just as the, uh, the uh, human body, you could think of it as being a load of telegraph systems that were communicating 
between the head and the body. The, the country was seen also as being like a body with the head, in our case, unfortunately, uh, in London, with everywhere centering on London. And this man, uh, Alfred Smee, largely forgotten these days, uh, he was an inventor, and he argued that literally what was happening in the brain was electro-telegraphic communication. It was exactly the same as what was happening in a telegraph system with messages going down the wires. And he tried to develop a way of understanding what the brain might be doing, developing these schema which um, he was kind of inventing off the top of his head. Nowadays, when I show this to computational scientists, they get incredibly excited by these images because they're very similar to the kind of structures that people imagine uh, going on inside deep learning programs today. And what we've got here are two versions. This is in a, a lower animal and this is in a human. You can see straight away they're a bit complicated, a bit more complicated in us. And this top bit here is what's happening in the brain. You've got the signals going up into the body and this kind of crisscross arrangement, he argues, shows how as he put it, the idea of a nest, a bee's nest, could be implanted in the in the bird. Uh, a nest could be implanted in a, the brain of a bird or of a honeycomb in the mind of a wasp or a bee. So he thought that these structures could actually encapsulate ideas. Now, what's strikingly lacking in here is any localization of function. But at the same time, as Smee was arguing these ideas, there was something called phrenology, which argued that by feeling the outside of your brain, you could, uh, outside of your skull, you could tell something about somebody's personality. Now, this is complete nonsense because the brain uh, is encased in the skull and the skull is very, very thick and you can't tell anything about the shape of somebody's brain through the outside of their skull. And even if you could, there is no like it localization of function uh, in these various parts. So uh, you haven't got human nature up here or destructiveness uh, above your ear. This is just silly. But this was widely believed throughout Europe, throughout much of the 19th century. And virtually every 19th century author that you read includes something about uh, phrenology uh, at some point in their writings. It was in incredibly significant in the 19th century. But there was an element of truth to it. And this to everybody's great surprise, was discovered first in the 1860s with what I'm doing now, speaking. Uh, so a Frenchman called Broca discovered that the front left part of the brain controlled speech. And this was doubly surprising and upsetting to him, firstly because it suggested that there was localization of function, and he was a French scientist, and all French scientists argued that there was no localization of function in the brain because Descartes had said that the mind was unitary, and if the mind was, then the brain had to be as well. Furthermore, Broca, Broca only found it on one side, and that's odd because the brain looks like it's symmetrical. So clearly there was asymmetry in some way on, on both, uh, in terms of control of speech. And by the early 1870s, this man, David Ferrier, he was able, using monkeys, to localise function in terms of control of movement and perception in these various areas here. So he put slender electrodes into this area and he would either uh, get a movement, the mo monkey's arm would twitch, say, or in the case of what we would now call auditory cortex, the ears would twitch as though the monkey had heard something. And by comparative anatomy, because he didn't do any experiments on humans, you could draw a similarity between, for example, area one here in a monkey and area one here uh, in a human. Now, it's very striking that there's one area that he hasn't got any response to, and that is what we would call Broca's area down here, which is controlling speech, because, of course, monkeys don't speak. But nonetheless, Broca, um, Ferrier was able to show that there was indeed localization of function in the brain. At the same time, in the late 19th century, Helmholtz, who was a German physiologist, he made the astonishing statement that the brain is not simply receiving information, but it is doing something. He argues 
it makes inductive conclusions about the world that it is that stimuli are interpreted according to certain rules and you project you make conclusions about what must be happening he, he worked this out in the simplest way possible through the visual system as i'm sure you know you have what is called a blind spot there is part of your visual field which is around about there for me which you cannot actually see because in that part of your retina which is looking at that point in your visual field there are no uh, sensory neurons it's where all the sensory neurons come together to form the optic nerve so in that part of your uh, nervous system your visual field you can't actually see anything but we don't get the impression that there's a hole there quite the opposite we are what happens is our brain makes an inductive conclusion it thinks a bit like in photoshop think well okay i'm just going to blur out that stuff there because i know there must be something there and i'm just going to kind of make it look as though it is so we don't have the impression that there's nothing there our brain is making a conclusion it's inducing uh, making an induction about what is happening and this man morgan who is an early psychologist he argues that the whole point of the brain and of consciousness is to control our movements. So we've got this idea now of the brain not simply being passive, it's doing things, it's controlling things, it's working things out. And the big metaphor, having moved away from the telegraph system, the problem with the telegraph system is that it's fixed. Yeah, your telegraph goes from London to Manchester and that's it. It has to be then picked up and you no more wires after you get the telegraph from the telegram from the telegraph telegraph exchange. But this system, a telephone exchange, which began in the 1880s, that's very different because it's flexible, because you can change where your numbers are connecting. OK, and this became widely used as a metaphor, a telephone exchange, a switchboard still used today because of the flexibility it involves. By the early years of the 20th century, people started to understand about feedback. And here we've got an example with Salino, the electric dog. And Salino, uh, you can see here, he's not really a dog. He's just a box with three wheels, one here, one here, and one at the back. And he's got two photoelectric cells. There's one here. And if you shine a light on that side, Salino will turn towards the light. So you can get movement positive feedback. He will move towards the light because uh, stim electric, electric signals from here are stimulating a motor at the back. Yeah, so it's turning itself. Now, this wasn't, this looks like a kind of joke. Uh, in fact, it was deadly serious because Meissner and the others who developed this dog, they wanted to develop a better torpedo. They knew the war was coming. And this, the dog, is in fact a kind of peaceful version of a homing torpedo that would be able to home in on its target and destroy a ship. Uh, and indeed, their uh, torpedoes proved immensely successful, we can say that, and destructive uh, in the First World War. And after the Second World War, after the First World War, this idea was developed more by this man, Lotka. Now, some of you may have come across Lotka in, if you've studied any ecology, because he is the man behind the, with Volterra, with the Lotka Volterra equations, which deal with cycling of predator and prey. But he also wrote popular science books and he became very, very interested in this ladybird, this little mechanical ladybird. And what he did was to realize that even something that is simply mechanical can show apparently purposive behavior. Now, if this was uh, in public, I would get out. I have one of these toys. I bought one on, on eBay. Uh, they make them in little retro uh, versions, uh, but in the Czech Republic. But I'm just going to show you a little video. So this is a plank of wood, and you're going to watch what this little clockwork beetle does. See, it goes, it avoids the edge. It goes on, and when it comes to an edge, it turns. Now, there's no electronics in here. There's nothing magic about it. It is simply clockwork. So how's it doing this? Well, this is what it looks like from the side. This is a, a version from uh, Locker's uh, book. 
So you've got a driving wheel, which is connected to the clockwork, which you've wound up, which makes it go forward. And these are the antennae that we saw uh, at the back, the little feelers uh, that we saw at the front of the animal. And they, whilst the animal is, the beetle is walk, going forwards on a flat surface, this part here, which is look, you're looking at sideways, this is a free wheel, it's not powered. It just has, it can just go round, okay? So this is a wheel that can go round. You're looking at it side on, yeah? And what happens is this goes forward, but then you can imagine when the antennae go off the edge of the, the plank or the table, then this will now touch the ground and will turn the overall effect is that the movement of the uh, beetle is now no longer forward, but is sideways. So in trying to understand what, I mean, this is incredibly simple. It's got, you know, it's just got a two moving parts to it and yet it produces intention or it looks like it's producing intentional intentionality. What Lotka said was that what's going on here is that this whole toy is construing the information. It's making sense of the information that is coming from here. And that's absolutely bizarre if you think about it, because there's, no, there's nothing going along here. It's simply the way it's been organized by the designers to produce this effect. So can we understand movement in terms of this kind of way of information being exchanged between different components of a structure? That was the key idea that Lotka had. And this was developed by Edgar Adrian, who's the first man to record uh, electrophysiological signals from single cells in the 1920s. And he was using amplifiers that had been developed during the war. So the significance of the technology has moved on. We're now thinking about messages and code. Again, these are very military uh, concepts that Adrian used in his public expl explanations of what he was doing to get over the idea. And what he said, for example, is there's a code in your neurons and you can see it here. Here we've got a different weights on a frog's leg um, and on a frog's muscle. And he's recording here from a stretch receptor. And you can see that with 50 grams, 100 grams, up to 500 grams, then you're getting a, an increasing firing rate. That's the code in the frog's stretch receptor for increasing weight. Now, that's not all Adrian did. He also uh, recorded EEG. So you record from the outside of the brain. Uh, and he was able to do, he'd do this in, in conferences, in scientific conferences. He'd sit down at the front, he'd put the electrodes on his head, and then he would go into the zone and get the alpha waves, which you can see here. Lovely alpha waves. This is what you get when you are, um, when you're, you're, you're meditating. But if he opened his eyes, it disappeared. If he shut them, it came back. Same thing would happen if he uh, was asked with his eyes shut to do some mental arithmetic. If they said, what's the square root of 87? Then the alpha wave would just disappear. Now, he not only did this in humans, in himself, that's who EDA is, Edgar Adrian. He also did it in water beetles. So water beetles are big beetles that live in fresh water. Um, and he put an electrode into its brain. And in the dark, you get a lovely alpha rhythm. If you turn the light on in the lab, it goes away. If you turn the light off again, you get the alpha rhythm back. Now, I don't know whether you got the same thing if you ask the beetle to work out the square root of minus, square root of 87. Who knows? I don't think Edgar Adrian ever tried that. So by the 18, 1940s, uh, you've got this man, Kenneth Craik, who, who is very interested in the ideas of Alan Turing and others. And he argues that what the brain does is to parallel or model external events. In other words, it's not simply as uh, been argued in the 19th century that the brain is representing things, that it is carrying out uh, calculations or making um, are making predictions about what will happen, but that it is actually modeling in some way the outside world. In some way, brains represent and model the outside world and can predict what will happen if certain things are done. And this was 
simultaneously in 1943, uh, around about the same time as Craik was writing, these two people, McCulloch and Pitts, wrote a very influential article in which they argued that the very organization of the nervous system has a logical function. Okay, and they said, look, if we, uh, we can imagine two neurons, one and two, and one sends its information up to two, okay, and then the message goes on. That's no problem. But you could also imagine uh, something like here, where you've got neuron three that will only respond if one and two stimulate it. So you've got an and function. Neuron three, the output of it, represents an and function. Neuron, this neuron here only fires if one or two is are active. So you've got an or function. Here, this neuron functions if one, but not two. So these basic logical functions, and, or, not, and so on, McCulloch and Pitts argued, said they're hardwired into the brain. Now, this isn't actually true. And, and you know, neurophysiologists got very cross about this because they went, well, that's just not how nervous systems are wired up. But the influence of this idea has been incredibly important because of this man, John von Neumann. And von Neumann is the man who devised the computers that you're all using. Every computer that we use has a von Neumann architecture. And what von Neumann did was to take McCulloch and Pitt's ideas. And he went to the American government in 1944 and said, I will build you a computer. And this computer will be built just like a brain because McCulloch and Pitt say that brains have this logical structure and I will therefore build you with a computer with that structure. Now, von Neumann and everybody else pretty re soon realized two things. Firstly, that the brain is not organized like that, but two, it didn't matter because this was extraordinary in terms of giving us computers that can do astonishing computations. So what happened was that in the beginning, although we now talk about the brain being like a computer, in the beginning, the computer was a brain. So. To summarize the first half of it, I mean, it's a little bit over the first half of the talk. Don't worry, I'm not going to go on for too much longer. This is what we think from about the 1950s, once the computer had become really powerful. This is more or less what we have been thinking for the last 50, 70 years, that a brain somehow contains symbolic representations of the outside world, that it manipulates some kind of computations. We don't really know what that is, but it, it carries out some kind of computations which enable it to predict what will happen and to produce appropriate behaviors. And amongst the processes it involves involved in doing this are feedback, both positive and negative, inhibition, and also probability calculations that the a brain uses to predict what happens. So that's what we think a brain does. <laughs> But that's a, that doesn't really help us. How does it do it? How are these processes represented in the brain? And that's where it gets really, really hard. So for a starting point, neurons aren't digital. So the parallel between the computer and the, the brain is just wrong at so many levels. So although a, uh, an action potential, a spike, either happens or doesn't, it doesn't happen, so that's digital, but that's not what neurons do and what the brain sees. We can see this here in Adrian's figure that I showed you earlier. This code is not digital, this code is analog. You're increasing your firing rate with increasing stimulus. So that's the information that the brain is getting. It's not a digital code at all. What about synapses? Well, not only are they not wired up like um, uh, McCulloch and Pitts argued, they are mind-bogglingly complicated. Each neuron, each synapse will have dozens, dozens of neurotransmitters. They have activation and inhibition, which again is not binary. A human synapse has over five and a half thousand different proteins in it. And you also get obviously hormonal effects. So it means it's not just what's happening here, but the surrounding medium can also alter, potentiate or reduce the activity of particular synapses. So it is really, really complicated. To give you an example, this is what I've spent most of my scientific career studying, the Drosophila maggot. And one of the things that a maggot does is to move like this, okay? 
it wriggles along. So you get a wave of motion going down the body wall. For that to work, the maggot needs to know that it has stretch. So it has stretch receptors in the body wall, okay? Here we are. This is a little diagram. This is the maggot's brain. So we're looking at it sideways, it's going forward. This is its brain, which is ventral. So it's in its belly, yeah? Um, and this is its head here. And in the body wall, you have repeated, because it's a segmented organism, as you can see, repeated neuromuscular junctions. So you have stretch, stretch receptors, that's what this is in here, which are connected both to the nerves and to the muscles which are producing this movement. And a single one, just one of these stretch cells, which are repeated over and over, and they're not connected to the brain, they're just connected to the ventral nerve cord. The brain's up here doing the complicated stuff. So all this is doing is saying, hey, I've stretched. It has 53 input synapses, 18 output synapses, is connected to a total of 74 other different cells, and many of those synapses have multiple neurotransmitters. So just to say, I've stretched, you've got this mind-boggling mind -boggling complexity in the muscle wall, not even in the brain. Uh, and here's another example. This is a tweet sent by Sophie Scott, um, who works on uh, hearing in humans. And she was very cross on Twitter uh, four years ago now. Things haven't got any better. She's studying the, how hearing works in a human. And you've got this input here. And then straight away, one neuron away from the cochlea, this is the cochlea, which is detecting the sounds, you end up with these multiple parallel streams, eight different cell types, five parallel processing streams. How do we understand it? She's just absolutely infuriated. And you may say, well, wait a minute, what about fMRI? What about those pictures we have of the brain lighting up when we see things? Okay, well, that's absolutely true. And this has been an amazing breakthrough, in particular in medicine, where you can see different parts of the brain, their activity represented uh, on a scan. But you have to realize that each, the, each of these little blobs is composed of what's called a voxel. So that's a cube, like a pixel, but in three dimensions. And that the finest resolution we have of one of these uh, scans, a single voxel, contains five and a half million neurons in the human brain, up to 55 billion synapses. These figures are absolutely right. I've checked them, right? I mean, it's mind boggling. 22 kilometers of dendrites, that's the input end, and 220 kilometers of output, of axons, it's the output side. So when you see one of these things, you need to remember that the degree of resolution for really knowing what's going on is just not precise enough because the brain is, the human brain is so compact. Above all, just because you know that a particular part of the brain lights up, so what? It doesn't tell you anything. How is it actually doing? Where is not how. If we want to know how things are working, we need to get on a, a more granular and more precise basis. And much of this work has been done uh, on the human eye, on the, human, on the visual system in cats and in, in mammals in general. And this is one of the early images that was constructed by uh, Hubel and Wiesel in the 1950s. And they suggested they found different parts of the, of the visual system would respond to dots or to lines. And they imagined a bit like uh, Smee's idea of a hierarchy that you could have a neuron here, for example, which if it was connected to four neurons, each of which detected a different dot in the environment, would end up being, if all those neurons fired, this one would say, ah, there's, an ang there's a line here, yeah? Because this line would stimulate all of these, the receptive fields of these four uh, neurons. And they imagined this kind of hierarchy of structures. And when I was a student, we all laughed at this because if you think about it, it's gotta be rubbish. You can't, this can't be how the visual system works because we can recognize things like our grandmothers, and if this is true, and you've got a cell that detects re responds to your grandmother, then you must have a cell that responds to your grandmother um, riding a horse. 
your grandmother riding a horse backwards, your grandmother riding a horse backwards, playing the guitar. And clearly that can't work. That can't be true because we can recognize each of those cases. It's clearly your grandma. Uh, it can't be true. Or is it? Because about 10, 12 years ago, some studies of humans, so this is awake humans who are being operated on having operations for severe epilepsy, and they very uh, kindly allowed researchers to record from their brains, from single cells in their brains, what, before the operation. So these are awake people who've got electrodes in their heads, and they're being shown various images. And this paper discovered, for example, in one patient, that there was a cell, one cell, that got amazingly excited by pictures of Jennifer Aniston. Now, it didn't like, and it would not have been interested in this picture because there's Brad Pitt, and this cell did not like pictures of Brad, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. It was only Jennifer Aniston that it was interested in. Somebody else had a cell that just responded to the Sydney Opera House, or even to the phrase, the right, the words, Sydney Opera House. So it was as though that cell somehow encoded a concept. So this is just bizarre. Does this mean that our brains are in fact full of grandmother cells, cells with really, really precise excitation? No, because in a way, this is a kind of illusion because what has happened is they've recorded from one cell, but that cell is not on its own. It's part of a network of neurons that will be involved in detecting, say, blonde women. So it may well have also responded slightly to this person behind, who may be somebody terribly famous. I don't know, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think she is, I think she's just another woman. So there will have been an overlap between these, the networks of cells responding to these two women. And one set of cells, one network, perhaps millions of cells, clearly must represent Jennifer Aniston, because if you know who she is, you can recognize her. And they just happen to be recording from one of those cells. And we now know that those networks of cells exist and they're not even permanent. They change over time. If you record from mice brains, the networks are shifting during the mouse's existence. They're not always the same. So the brain is incredibly fluid, even for something like recognizing faces. You may say, well, what about computers? Can't they help? Well, um, here's some example from uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who works now for Google. Uh, and a few years ago, he gave a one of these cl very clever deep learning programs, loads and loads of YouTube videos to watch. This was about 10 years ago, um, before YouTube got full of conspiracy theories. So there were lots and lots of cat videos on YouTube then. And this is what, to, to their surprise, they just said to the machine, what can you recognize in this endless stream, clearly not of actual videos, but of zeros and ones, because all these things can do is see patterns. And what it came up with, was a cat detector because there were lots of cat videos. See, this is the this is the platonic cat it could detect. These are its ears, its head, its ears, and so on, its face. Yeah. Oops. Can you see? Now, this wasn't always good at detecting cats, but it could still detect cats pretty accurately. And the problem is, as a researcher asked him, asked Jeffrey Hinton, you don't know how these things work, do you? And he says, no, we have no idea. So all these clever programs you hear about, they are amazing. AlphaFold, which will predict protein conformation, astonishing, but we don't know how it's doing it. We can see this in these, these suites. Uh, we have them in the UK. They're called Love Hearts. Maybe you have something similar in Italy. And they are, their children love them. They're really acidic. And they have these little phrases on them, find me, love bug, and all the rest of it. And an AI researcher called Janelle Shane, she gave one of these clever programs, which can write, it can write articles. So it's very, very clever. It's, it's eaten the whole of the internet. Um, what can you make me a single a love heart. You can see they've only got two words in them. Yeah, they're, so it's pretty simple. And this is what it came up with, which uh, even if your English isn't very good, I think you can get the impression that these things are just nonsense. And the reason why they're nonsense is that the program doesn't understand context. 
It can't understand what a love heart is. It just knows there's got to be two words there. And it can come up things like fart, booby, balls. Okay, so computers aren't going to help us. Final example, we're getting to the end now. I'm just going to talk about very briefly, just to explain the, the, the difficulty we have. It's the work of Eve Marder. Eve Marder is a researcher who has spent the whole of her life understanding or trying to understand the lobster's stomach. Not its brain, but its stomach. And the lobster's stomach has just 30 neurons in it. And those neurons power uh, um, two kinds of grinding motion that the stomach does to grind up the lobster's food. So a network of 30, 30 neurons produces two alternative rhythms. And Professor Marder knows everything about those neurons. She knows their connectome. She knows exactly how they're organized, the neurotransmitters, the genes that are expressed in there, everything. And yet, despite being incredibly smart, despite all her work, for decades, she cannot explain why those 30 neurons produce those two rhythms. She knows from computer models that other patterns of behavior could be produced by those 30 neurons, but they don't appear. She knows that other networks could produce those two activities, but they are not found in lobsters. She can't predict what will happen if she removes one of those neurons in uh, the, the stomach, she can't predict what will happen using a computer model. So remember the lobster's stomach, anybody ever says they understand the brain. We don't understand the lobster's stomach. So what's the way forward? Now, I think uh, that small brains are the way to go. And these could be things like this uh, platinaris, which is the embryo of it. it's a larval worm, which has got a brain of about 120 neurons. And we have the connectome could be the zebrafish larva, 100 neuro, 100,000 neurons or Drosophila, where you've got two organisms in one. You've got 100,000 neurons in the fly's brain and about 10,000 in the maggot. And I think establishing the principles of how brains work using small brains that you can take apart and do all sorts of things with, that is probably uh, going to be the way to go. So what's the future then? I think what we've learned from here is that science, culture and technology are intertwined. The science doesn't take place in a vacuum. It uses technology to understand things. They provides us meta with metaphors. The brain is like a and then you put in the latest technology and it will help you think in that ways. But those metaphors, like all models, are limited. They are not the thing itself. There are absences, there are things lacking. And a framework, a way of thinking about something is incredibly powerful, but there comes a point at which it restricts us. It prevents us from seeing outside. Thinking about the brain as being like a telegraph system prevents you from thinking about flexibility, about plasticity. So maybe thinking about the, compute, the brain like a computer is preventing us from thinking about some things. So we know that new technological developments will change how we can imagine what the brain does. The future is going to be different and we will reinterpret some of our current knowledge and we will be able to imagine different experiments. Now, in the past, um, when I've said this, people then immediately want to say, well, what's the next thing? What's the future? Um, and I have said, I don't know. And they got rather cross with me. They want to know what the future is going to be. So to get over that problem, I've now built a time machine, we can see into the future. Okay, so the next slide is gonna take us into the app I've built, which looks into the future and shows us the future technology. It, 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 I mean, like all technology, modern, you know, breaking ground technology, it's not perfect. And God damn it. No. Oh. Okay, it's not working. You're, you're gonna have to work out what the future is yourselves. OK, thank you. That was a joke. Um, and uh, here's the book, which is available in English and uh, also in Italian. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions if you've got time. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, did enjoy it, especially like the love hearts. They were very funny. <laughs> um, uh, so we do have 10 minutes now for questions. Um, so if anyone wants to ask anything, you can put it in the chat and I'll read it out. Or um, 
use the reaction to put your hand up and turn microphones on. Uh, so, yeah, Tana, I see your hand. Hello, um, I'm also a placement student from Manchester here. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. The gang's um, <laughs> yes, I just wanted to ask um, if there is any more specific examples of how you know that what what we or what they in the past knew up about the brain influenced the development of computers and technology and things. Are there some specific examples? Because I looked into uh, deep learning and I found it quite interesting. So then to see your reference, your link to it, it I, I was I just wanted to know if you know anything more about well, this yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, it was extremely significant. So uh, you, you, you've got to go a bit. I mean, deep learning is simply the latest version uh, of a, uh, a set of complicated uh, computer programs which were developed, in fact, in the 1950s, virtually as soon as computers, I mean, they were still big enough to fill a room, but people started to use, uh, develop computer models for uh, pattern recognition, for letters, to be able to detect letters and so on. And they were trying to use I mean, it's, I think the technology has more gone from looking at the brain to developing new computers rather than the other way around. People have, part of the problem is that the, the, the way that many of these programs work, going back to the 1950s, is they have what's called a hidden layer. That's the middle bit. The com and that's why people get excited when I show the, the pictures of SMEs diagrams with all that crisscross because that's kind of what they think is happening. And that's what Hinton means when he says, we don't know how it works. They're not sure how these programs are extracting the information that they can see. So people have tried to come up with animal models where they can think there might be a similar kind of structure. And there's been some very interesting work done on Drosophila um, on uh, part of the brain, which is involved in, uh, in uh, memory and olfactory memory in particular, structures called the mushroom bodies, which every insect has. Um, and they think there's a, there's a hypothesis that there are a similar kind of connections that develop with time that are similar in, in uh, organization to the kind of middle layer of these deep learning programs, but they, they've got to demonstrate it. And part of the problem is it's much easier to do in a computer program than it is to do in an animal, which is hard. You know, I mean, all animals differ. That's part of, you know, they're, they're, diff they're individuals. They ha don't have exactly the same wiring diagram. Even C. elegans, which doesn't really have a brain, only got 302 neurons. And that wiring diagram, which suggests it's another metaphor, suggests it's really fixed. I mean, worms aren't all the same. Each worm behaves in a slightly different way. Um, so th there's a problem about really drawing parallels between animals and machines in that animals are, are alive. Yeah. And that's one of the big differences. Yeah. Thank you. And just say I really, really enjoyed the talk, especially the little jokes here and there. Good. Got to keep them laughing. Yeah. The Italian audience got them. I tried to make it as simple as possible. I'm sure at least the love hearts. <laughs> well, okay. Um, Annabelle, I, oh, I'm Professor Pitti, but Annabelle first. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Professor Tetti. You can go ahead first. Uh, okay, so um, <laughs> Matthew, I'm the, the mentor of these uh, girls from um, uh, Manchester, so I'm very happy to contribute to the, say, scientific development. Uh, your talk has been really inspiring because uh, uh, it's nice to see also what um, the, in, in, in previous uh, times, uh, scientists did. Because sometimes we feel that we are, we, we are the only one to have um, sophisticated technologies, and, but this is not true. And also it's important to see how uh, we got to the knowledge that we have. Because sometimes my impression is that we are rescoring the, the hot water. Yeah. Absolutely. have been done in, uh, in the past. In any case, uh, um, uh, our brain receives so many information that at a certain point we have to cut many of them. For instance, we don't feel our dresses on or we can uh, uh, remove some noise uh, from the... Uh, so is this something that uh, um, happens also in the computer or, uh, uh, or, or not? <laughs> ah, that's very interesting. I, th I thought you were going to ask about simple animals, whether they 
uh, equally showed that kind of habituation or adaptation. And of course they do. Um, that's never occurred to me about computers. Um, I think, I mean, you might well be able to, you know, you can program a computer to ignore stuff. Obviously you could say, if a signal is repetitive, you know, or if it's a spam email, then, you know, put it in the bin because it's rubbish. But as we know, it, you sometimes find very important things in your spam box. You have to go in there every now and again because the, the rules that we come up with um, aren't quite accurate enough. Um, so, I mean, in general, your computer is paying attention to stuff all the time. It's waiting to get input from, you know, I haven't touched my mouse for five minutes, but it, it's still waiting for that stimulus to come. So, uh, and you'd be quite annoyed, I suppose, if your computer then, you know, wanted you to move the mouse a lot. So you would pay attention. Uh, you would know it was, it would know it was a significant uh, input. Um, I think that's very interesting. I, I really don't know the answer to that. I, I hadn't thought about that. I need to think about that some more. But I, I, as I say, I think we can think about things like spam filters, but there are limits to that. But maybe, yeah, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm also a previous Manchester student, <laughs> actually a previous student of yours. So it's it's lovely to hear one of your your talks again. Um, so I had one question for you, really, just to get your thoughts on the the development and the progress in the field of organoids, particularly in the brain, and generally, really, just to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. I, well, I, hmm, I mean, I don't work in the field. Okay. So. Um, uh, I, they worry me. Mm -hmm. I think they're very exciting. And I think for understanding, uh, so, you know, for people who don't know, these are uh, using stem cells, you can make stem cells turn into uh, brain cells, which will then divide and you're not telling them what to do. Uh, they will divide, they will do things like uh, form an eye, or at least photo receptive cells, which will then become connected up to each other. So this little blob of tissue uh, can then start responding to light. Um, now, what's worrying, of course, is, well, if you leave them growing for long enough, how would you know if they, especially if they were human cells and if they grew big enough, how would you know if they were conscious or not? And this is clearly a problem we've got with animals. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a uniquely uh, organoid problem. Um, so I'm, I'm worried, and the answer of course is we don't know. Uh, so I worry about them. I know that people who work with organoids are very kind of confident, uh, but I'm not sure they, they, they should be. So I think we need to think about this, and I know ethicists are concerned about it. Um, I mean, sometimes, so there have been things that I just really find unpleasant. So for example, um, one of the in interesting things is how we differ from Neanderthals, okay? So between a human, and a Neanderthal, there are only 96 amino acid differences. So that's a very, very small number. But clearly uh, there will have been regulatory differences producing differences in our, in our body shape at least, and perhaps in our intellectual uh, abilities, although perhaps not. So one of the things people are interested in is trying to work out what the differences were between us and them, were there behavioral differences? Um, and uh, so, one person in America, and this is a genuine proposal, says he's going to grow organoids from a human and from using Neanderthal genome. In other words, he's going to mutate a human genome, a human cell, uh, human cells and change them so that they're like the uh, Neanderthal genome. And then he's going to get these organoids to control little, uh, little robots and he's going to race them. And I just think that's kind of obscene, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, it, I mean, this is a genuine proposal from a very clever guy in California. Um, and I just think you really need to think about the ethics of this a bit more. Um, I, I think that I think that's wrong. And now maybe I can't identify why. On the other hand, for understanding disease and for understanding development, I think these are extraordinary things. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, you know, you shouldn't ever do this. I just think that there are people are perhaps getting carried away and need to 
think like you would with an embryo. You know, you can't keep embryos for very long. And that's not simply because it gets difficult, but it's for ethical reasons. And I think we should probably have a, a, a limit in terms of the number of cells in an organoid, a brain organoid anyway, um, before you stop, uh, before you chop, you know, before you kill it. Um, yeah, and so I, I don't know. I don't know whether that helps or not. But as I say, it is not my field. So I, I, I could easily be, uh, be wrong on this. No, that's great. Thank you so much. That's a really interesting insight. Okay. Um, I know we have reached time, but I did have one I can, more question. I can hang around. I'm not going anywhere. I can hang about. It's up to you. Okay. If people have got somewhere to go to, they can go away, or you can. I can. I'm happy to stay. Um, well, that's the, I had one question. That's actually not my question. Uh, my dad is a fan of yours. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> um, and. Uh, he wanted me to ask you, he's an education researcher, about this idea that uh, we can use neuroscience to kind of um, understand how people learn and then design learning tools to mm. reflect that. And what you thought, do you think that's true? Mm. Well, again, it's, it's not my domain. I'm not an educationist. I mean, part academia, science, education, they all have fashions uh, and neuroscience uh, has for this century uh, has had a great deal of influence on the humanities in particular so uh, there was a period about five or six years in which historians and uh, people studying literature and art all sorts of people you wouldn't think would be interested in neuroscience got very very excited about it and then it kind of faded away because it didn't actually provide much insight um, I think that's probably the case in, um, in educational research as well. Um, I mean, I can think about fashions that have gone through, we've been told that uh, uh, having kind of seminars, what's called flipped classroom, where every, all the students have done the reading before, and then you ask them a load of questions in the lecture, rather than giving them a lecture, that's the way to go. And then I heard yesterday that it wasn't, and it was all rubbish, <laughs> and that we should be doing something else. So I think there's a lot of fashion and that's partly because teaching is really, really hard. And I mean, doing it right is really hard. And how can you, you know, what is good teaching? So for example, you know, I think all three Manchester students have probably got good memories of my lectures, but what do you actually remember of what I said? <laughs> and does it matter? You know, so does it matter if three or four years later, you can't really remember anything I told you or anything you learned on that course, does that matter? Uh, you know, that distance, is it, is it important or is it just inspiration? And, oh, that was great, yeah. Is that all we're after? So it's, it's very hard to know what we are supposed to be doing. I know in, in universities, we know exactly what we're doing. We're teaching you for the exam and you pass the exam and then you move on. But does it have to be longer than that? Is, is there, should we be striving for learning that goes beyond simply the end of year exams. Well, I think we should, but trying to remember stuff and concepts is really hard. I mean, I can never remember. I'm always forgetting names and uh, ideas and things. I have to write it all down because it just goes. So I, I think you can say to your dad and maybe the student, you'd all recognize this as students that education is focused on testing. But I think from the other side of the, the lecture theater, we like to imagine that our lecturers our teaching goes beyond that, but I'm not sure that it does, or how we could test that, or how we could train ourselves to be even better at it. So I'm not, the short answer to your dad is, I'm not sure that neuroscience can really help us, but better education research probably will. I doing controlled studies of different forms of uh, education and seeing how that lasts or doesn't over not only months, but years. Thank you. I will pass on to him. Um, yeah, it is interesting to hear about that perspective from a lecturer because, you know, we do discuss as students teaching yeah. and how good it was and how good it wasn't. Well, you know, every teacher is different. And, you know, I have, I mean, I know that students, many, but not all, you know, I get every year I get comments. So the students make comments and they will, some students will say, this is the best lecturer I ever had. 
And then I will also get other students who absolutely hate me and can't stand it and said, he's the worst lecturer I've ever had. I can't remember anything. I, you know, I look at my notes and I've no idea what he said. So there's a, you know, I think that's, you know, we're all different. Teachers are all different and students are all different and students like different things. Okay. Um, I see that Claudia has her hand up. Um, okay. yeah. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, Claudia. <laughs> I'm a, an Italian student. <laughs> so uh, I have a curiosity. Um, so um, in the past, there has been drastic use of electrical stimulation on the brain to treat uh, uh, psychiatric illness. Uh, uh, which has labeled it uh, uh, harmful. So um, today, can we use it uh, in a moderate way to try, uh, for example, to um, cure some uh, disease like Alzheimer or uh, another illness? Yeah, so th the most depressing part of uh, writing this book, so the book's divided into, well, into three halves. <laughs> But only really two. So it's divided into the past and then the present, which basically goes like in my talk from about 1950, because that's where we've been since the 1950s. We've had the same view about what the brain is and how it works. We've had the computational model and we've also understood about neurotransmitters. So we've got a chemical model and those two don't really fit together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what was most depressing was writing uh, the chapter about mental health because uh, we have far greater awareness or we are prepared to admit to mental health problems. We are aware as educators that students can suffer from depression, from anxiety and so on. And yet the technology we have for curing that, for really making a difference is very, very rudimentary. Um, and, you know, we have chemical treatments, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of argument about. Mm -hmm. um, and what's most striking is that the, um, the pharmaceutical companies have given up on this. So none of the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies anywhere have any pipeline for producing new chemical treatments for depression, anxiety, they're trying to get a hand on Alzheimer's, but we don't know what Alzheimer's is and really. I mean, it's probably lots of things like schizophrenia is lots of things. So um, the problem is that I think we've got mental health. Our phenotypes are multiple. We give a single word to depression, but in fact, there's going to be lots and lots of different ideas, different things happening that can produce the same uh, problems. Uh, and what's striking is that the way people talk about depression, for example, um, and the way that they talk about treatments for depression, in particular with serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, the most widely used ones, is it's very much like Galen talked about with the humors. You talk about a chemical imbalance. You haven't got enough serotonin. You need to increase it. And that's just like Galen talking about black bile or one of you know, the four humors, we, we haven't really got beyond that. To answer your question, because you did ask her about electrical treatment, which I think is very interesting. So I was amazed to see that Aldini in the 1810s, Aldini in Italy was treating people with electric, electric shocks. There were two people who had, from what the accounts, seemed to be something like depression. And he would give them shock treatment with it. I mean, he didn't know what he was doing, of course, but he would shock them and they both showed some improvement. Now, that's an anecdote, it's not a study, but we do know that uh, um, shock treatment, which uh, gets a very bad press, there's uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, the film, which is terrifying. Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons to think that this was awful in the 1950s and 1960s. But there is also evidence to show that it can help in some cases, but we don't know what it's doing. But then we don't know what SSRIs are doing. So, you know, the, the real problem is this is the scale of the issue we have in front of us is that our understanding 
of a functioning, a normally functioning brain is really pretty poor. So understanding a brain when it doesn't quite work right, and is that the brain? Is it the chemistry? Is it the electrochemistry? Is it the anatomy? Or is it psychology? Understanding which level it's at. I mean, it's really, really hard. Um, and anybody who's gone through mental health problems or who has somebody like me, has somebody in their family who's had severe mental health issues, knows that it is very, very hard sometimes to find help for them. Uh, and that, as I said, was the most depressing thing that I wrote yeah. about. <laughs> Thanks. I found your presentation very clear and uh, sometimes funny. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, I do have one more of my own. I'm aware I'm keeping okay. this going if anyone needs to leave. Um, which is about the your career as a kind of whole moving from yes um, like experimental research to more of this history of science and the book writing and um, science communication um, how was that transition made I guess well yeah I mean don't don't look to me for any advice I think the key th so look you know academics like to uh, think or at least say that they got to where they are because they were very clever and clearly you've got to be vaguely talented but actually they were just lucky right we're all incredibly lucky um, and I, I often say to undergraduates to PhD students you know you shouldn't embark on a, an academic career thinking or planning rather and hoping to end up in my chair, because that is just so unlikely, not because you're not good, but just because me getting here was incredibly unlikely. I can't remember how, I'm not sure how many of my PhD cohort in Sheffield ended up uh, in academia. I think I may be the only one. And others of them went on, I, mean, you know, I know they went off and became potters. They make pottery and they you know, do all sorts of strange things. Um, so I think what people should do uh, in terms of science is do it if they want to, if they find it exciting. And I don't think that means you've got to sacrifice your whole life to it, not at all, but you've got to want to do it because sometimes it's rubbish, it doesn't work. And you've got to get through those bad moments by being motivated. But I, in particular, I think people need to think about other career opportunities. Science and academia is not the only one. Uh, and there aren't enough jobs. There aren't enough permanent jobs. We're not dying. You've got to push people like me under the bus. Uh, and then there'll be jobs that will appear. But seriously, there aren't enough jobs. So people do their PhD, they do postdoctoral research, and they need to think about other opportunities in case the academic opportunities don't turn up. And that's not because you're not good, but just because random stuff happens. Um, my other advice to people is if you're interested in history, um, and in particular, I say this to uh, early career researchers, is wait, <laughs> because most, unless you're a historian, wait until you've got a full-time permanent job and then you can do that because in general universities don't particularly like this kind of thing uh, what they like is research grants and research publications and whilst I've had some of that as well I haven't had anywhere near as much as I probably ought to have done uh, if I'd been luckier um, so uh, I think you know science is an amazing subject but understanding its past and trying to think about its future is also quite exciting and there are opportunities for doing that if that's really what you want to do then you know the history of science uh, and science communication are perfectly um good and excellent careers that you can you can go into and one of the reasons why to close i i've been tolerated in manchester for this kind of stuff is that we have a history of science uh, department uh, we have a group of researchers who work on the history of science, technology and medicine. So I kind of fit in with them as well as uh, carrying on my own work on, on, on Drosophila. So enjoy it, but think about doing other things all the time. Look at, look, for, look at other opportunities. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I will let you go and close okay. the session. Thank you very right, much well, for coming. Uh...
Thanks a lot for inviting me, Oriana. Uh, don't hesitate to email me if you or uh, I've forgotten her name. Hannah, was it the other student who's uh, yeah, if you've got any questions for me, I'm happy to answer. You may get a quicker answer from me from your than from your program directors because I made size vast. Um, I will uh, I'm happy to answer any questions about your return to Manchester and maybe see you on my course on sense of smell and taste uh, in October, November. OK. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much again. Ciao, ciao. See you again. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.